to God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You, we praise You, we love You. And now, Lord, as we go to Your Word, we ask that Your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And Lord, I know for a lot of us it's been a long day. Make this the most attentive hour of our week, Lord, that we would hear from You and receive all You have for us. Lord, we don't want the words of man, that's a waste of time. We pray the Word of God would go forth with power. We ask these things in Your holy and Your precious name, we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 So 1 Samuel, we've been talking about this. This is the transition from the prophets to the kings. And if you'll remember that the last of the prophets was Samuel, and then we, we saw how God brought him into a family when Hannah cried out when she couldn't have children, and how she said, if you give me a son, I'll dedicate him to you. Well, now we've already gone through basically most of Samuel's life. There's some more of Samuel we're going to see in the coming chapters, but he's no longer a baby that was delivered to Eli. He is now a man probably in his 80s. And so in the last few weeks, we've seen that transfer take place. First of all, we saw the king that men uh, cried out for. His name is? What's, what's the name of the king that the people cried out for? Thank you. People say, why do you repeat stuff? This is why. Can I get an amen? So King Saul, King Saul was... They wanted a king because of the nations around them had a king. And that's the same trap that we can fall in as Christians today. We fall into that same trap by wanting what the world has. Looking to the world's example, God was their king and they cried out for a king. And they were warned, if you cry out for him as a king, he will enslave your children. He'll put you in bondage. Before it's over, you'll be crying out to be delivered from him. And they said, we don't care, give us a king anyway. And Saul started off well, and they started to think they were okay for raising him up as their king. But just like we can, sometimes we'll live in a a way that's outside of God's will, and for a period of time, there may not be any consequences. And we may may think that uh, God's grace is God's permission. You know, the fact that God is actually being gracious to us and giving us an opportunity to repent. Well, we saw Saul's colors, true colors come through when they fought against the Amalekites, when he brought back Agag, the king in the flesh. Samuel told him, the kingdom's been ripped from you and given to another. Who was the kingdom given to? King David. Then we saw that God called Samuel to go out and anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. If you guys remember, even Samuel, like us, can fall into the same trap because he was looking at the biggest and the best looking and the oldest of the sons. And each one came by and Samuel kept saying, this must be the one. And God made it clear to Samuel, it's not him. And finally, they get to the end. He says to Jesse, you got any more sons? Oh, we got the, you know, par- Pastor Day paraphrase. We got the run of the litter. He's out watching the sheep. He said, why don't you bring him in here? And they brought him in and said, this is the one. See, man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart. Amen? We can be impressed by outward appearance. That means absolutely nothing to God. By the way, if we have an outward appearance, God gave it to us anyway. Can I get an amen to that? So he's anointed king, but after being anointed king, he goes back and is, is caring for the sheep. And I love David's humility. See, where Saul was a very prideful man and loved to hear people sing his praises, David was a very humble man. A couple chapters ago in chapter 17, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, my, dad, my parents, you know, my mom and dad named me David, and I remember the first time I heard the story of David and Goliath. By the way, if you go to Israel with us, we're going to be in the Valley of Elah, and we're going to see where the, the Philistines were, and where the Israelites were, and where the battle took place, and we're, you can even come home with some of the stones out of the brook, where David pulled the stone out of the brook. So, Bible rocks, going to get an amen. Looking forward to that. But as we saw, that everybody was fearful who was looking at things, and this applied to tonight's chapter. They were looking at things from a physical perspective because Goliath was anywhere from nine and a half feet to 11 feet tall, between 625 and 750 pounds. So 11 foot 750, that's kind of intimidating. And Saul had already been told the kingdom is ripped from you, so he was supposed to be their champion to go down and fight Goliath. And Goliath came down for 40 days. 40 in the Bible is the number of? testing and you know 40 days and 40 nights it rained jesus was tempted in the wilderness so 40 days and 40 he comes down day after day and he defies the armies of israel send down your you know send down your champion and every day all the children of israel would shake in their boots and finally david is off tending the sheep he's the real king of israel he's off tending the sheep finally his father says i want you to take this cheese to your brothers i want you to find out what's going on with them he's basically the milkman as i said he shows up with some cheese But you know what happened? When David came into the camp, the Holy Spirit came into the camp. 
And that's why everything changed. And when David saw 11 foot 750, he didn't see a giant against a mere man. He saw a mere man against Almighty God. See, guys, our foes are only great if our God is small. We don't serve a small God. We serve a great God. We saw that on Sunday, didn't we, Charmaine? We serve a great God. Wasn't Sunday wonderful? We did a baby dedication of a baby that we prayed for that was from the third month, third month of her pregnancy. They weren't sure if she was going to be able to bring the baby to full term and the baby would survive. God answered our prayer. And then Charmaine got up and shared about her cancer. And guess what? God has delivered her from it. We serve a great and awesome God. Can we get an amen? amen. And so our God is great. And that's why the things that we face in life, we're going to see that tonight, are small compared to the God that we serve. We know the end of the story. David goes out and fights the battle. Saul tries to put his armor on him. We don't want to do it in our strength. He goes out. And, you know, he had been fighting lions and bears when nobody was watching and had no idea that God was preparing him to fight a giant when everyone was watching. And sometimes we go through trials and difficulty and we have no idea. I want to encourage you that no suffering is wasted and everything we're going through is preparation for the next thing God has for us. Can I get an amen to that? There's an opportunity for us in the trials we go through, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that God comforts us in our suffering, that we may then comfort others with the comfort that we have received. See, He comforts us so we can comfort others. He shows up in a mighty way for us so we can, get, we can strengthen the faith of others, and that's King David. The only thing about King David is he did so well that Saul started to get jealous. We saw this last week, where King Saul was getting bummed out because David not only defeated Goliath, but he was chasing the Philistines. And then he went out and was so, had done so well, had been so victorious, that they started singing songs about Saul. Saul has slayed his thousands. He liked that. Until he said, and David his tens of thousands. And then if you were here last week, you saw that David was there continuing to serve at the feet of Saul, even though he's the anointed king. Even though he's the one that defeated Goliath, even though he's the one that was winning the, the battles on the battlefield, he still remained humble and broken because he knew that he deserved none of the credit. God deserved all the credit. And that's a man or a woman that God can use, someone who's humble and broken and desperate and gives all the credit to the one who deserves it. Can I get an amen to that? So here he is, and he's coming in because there's a distressing spirit on Saul, and he plays worship. Whenever he plays worship, the distressing spirit flees from him. And even after he had won the battle, even after he'd done all that, he went, then he, he, you know, he, he had had promises made by Saul, and Saul didn't come through. Remember, he said, whoever defeats Goliath, I'll give you my daughter. Then he gave his daughter to somebody else. And then he told him, if you want my other daughter, I need 100 foreskins of the Philistines. And people don't like giving those up. Can I get an amen to that? I said last week... You know, there's things in the Bible I'd love to see on video. That's not one of them, amen? And the reality is he goes out and goes above and beyond and is given his daughter, and that brings us to, to tonight's chapter. So David has been victorious, but just remember last week, though, one of the other things that happened, David was playing worship, and the distressing spirit was leaving Saul. And what did Saul do? He threw a spear at him. You know what's amazing? It says he threw a spear at him twice. That means that David came back the next day. If my boss takes a shot at me at work, I'm probably not showing up tomorrow, amen? But David was such a man that he knew that God was in control. He put his life into the hands of the Lord. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, amen? Grab your outline. We're going to dig into the text. I tell the message, you're not alone in the midst of your trials. Isn't that good to know? Isn't it good to know that when you go through difficulties of life, sadly, people who don't know the Lord, a lot of times they are alone. They're in despair. They're troubled. By the way, I just saw this as sidestep just for a second. 41% of all uh, kids or young people or even older people who deal with, you know, think they're transgendered and decide to live as the other sex, 41% of them try to commit suicide. People who aren't, it's less than 4% who even attempted in their lifetime. You know why? Because that's not how God created us. Can I get an amen to that? God has created us in his image. And what happens is sadly, when people are, are you know, living their own life apart from the Lord, there's, there's no joy, there's no peace. In the midst of the trials, they feel like they're alone. I'm so glad that as believers, we're never alone. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And even when you're overwhelmed, our God is greater still. So first we're going to see there, 
here's the truth, seeing the, our trials from an eternal perspective. Do you know there's an enemy who wants to destroy you? The Bible says that Satan seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. Here's the good news, though. He's toast. Can I get an amen to that? He's a defeated foe. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But there is an enemy who seeks to destroy you. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy, you know, your health if he can. He wants to destroy your He wants to destroy you. He wants to render you ineffective for the kingdom of God. He wants you to rebel against the Lord so your testimony is destroyed. If he can't take you to hell with him, he wants to keep you ineffective for the kingdom of God until you get to heaven. And our heart ought to be, Lord, I got one life to live. I want to live it for you. So the first thing we're going to see, there's the enemy who wants to destroy you, but then we're going to see five ways that God ministers to us in the midst of great difficulty. Number one, you have a prince and a best friend who intercedes on your behalf. Isn't it good to know, what's Jesus doing right now? See, so at the right hand of the Father doing what? He's interceding for us. Isn't it good to know, since God is for us, who can be against us? Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. So guys, even though we go through great trials, it's good to know that he is the Prince of Peace. We're going to see the Prince in tonight's text, a picture of the Lord, but also the best, a best friend who intercedes on our behalf. The second thing that we see in ways God ministers to us amidst of great difficulty, the enemy's power is limited to what God will allow. Do you know the devil can't do anything unless God says it's okay? Ask Job. Amen? And the reality is it has to go through God's. So I, I have the peace in knowing that if it got to me, it went through God's hand first. And we need to learn to trust in the sovereignty of God. So if we go through great physical difficulty, or we go through financial difficulty, or we go through things that we never expected in life, it's good to know that I had to go through God's hand before it got to me. There's peace in the sovereignty of God. Can we say amen to that? And praise the Lord for it. Now I want to say this quickly though. Sometimes... The trials we go through is not because it was the enemy attacking us and God allowed it to get through his hands. Sometimes it's the consequences of our own rebellion. Can I get an amen to that? So be careful. Don't, don't mistake your rebellion for God allowing the enemy to, to come against you because sometimes it's just plain stinking us. The third thing we're going to see, five ways God ministers to us in great difficulty, through his bride, the church, who ministers to you in the midst of your imperfections. And the, is the church perfect? What's the answer? I mean, in God's eyes, he sees us holy, doesn't he? He sees us as a pure white bride. But by the way, if you're looking for a perfect church and you're shopping for a perfect church, you're not going to stay at very many churches very long, including this one. Can I get an amen to that? And if you find the perfect church, don't go there because you'll mess it up. Amen? But the reality is that there's a reason why we need fellowship because Christianity is not for the Lone Ranger. And when we are off on our own, by the way, do you do better when you're out of, do you, you really grow spiritually when you're out there all on your own? No, God has called us. Forsake not the gathering yourselves together, and all the more as the day approaches. When you come to church, you get ministered to, but you also have the opportunity to use the gifts God's given you to minister to others. Amen? Number four, five ways God ministers to us in great difficulty. The prophetic truth of the word of God brings you comfort, wisdom, and peace. Isn't that true? Who's our mighty counselor? The Lord and his word. Can I get an amen to that? I had someone call me today. I get these often. And, and look, I love you guys. You know I'm for you. And people get mad at me that I'm not a big fan of psychology. And, and I'm not. You know why I'm not? Now look, I think we need to have Christian therapists everywhere we can get them. Can I get an amen to that? I want Christian teachers. I want Christian social workers. I want Christian therapists. I want Christians everywhere. Can I get an amen to that? But as Christians, we don't rely on worldly wisdom. We rely on godly wisdom. Can I get an amen to that? Because worldly wisdom, a lot of psychology and a lot of that, it comes from dead atheists. I don't need Freud's counsel. He needs ours. Well, it's too late now. Amen. But the reality is that we live in a time where we run to the world for answers. Guys, we don't want to run to the world. We want to run to the Lord. And we want to run to his word. Can I get an amen to that? Guys, this is the mighty counselor. Amen? This is the word of God. And God gave it to us. He wrote it down. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to understand it. And that's why I love having people in positions of counseling people who are desperate, who know Jesus, who can give them the real hope that they need. Amen? The real hope just isn't overcoming the problem. The real hope is coming to know the true and living Savior. Amen? 
So the thing we're going to see there fourthly is the prophetic truth of God's word brings comfort, wisdom, and peace. And then finally, we're going to see God ministers to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. You know that, right? It's not an essence or a being or a feeling. The Holy Spirit is God. The third part of the Trinity. And that means God lives in you. It doesn't mean you're not God, but he lives in you. Amen? And what a blessing that he never leaves us. So let's begin there looking at verse... 1 of First Samuel 19. You're not alone in the midst of, tri- of your trials. Let's go back. I'm going to read verse 28 to 30 to give us context, and then we'll read verse 1. Look, look at verse 28 to 30 in chapter 18. Then Saul saw knew that the Lord was with David, and then Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. Remember, it's interesting. Saul hates David because he's envious, but Saul's son, Jonathan, loves David, and now Saul's daughter, Micah, Michael, loves David and is married to David. And it says, and Saul was still more afraid of David, so Saul became David's enemy continually. Here's something that will happen. If you live a fruitful, sold-out life for Jesus Christ, there will be people who will become your enemy because of it. Right now, is it popular to speak the truth of God's word? Is it popular to condemn ungodly behavior before a lost and a dying world? You're considered a homophobe or a xenophobe, you know, whatever phobes, right? I'm just, I'm just a xenophobe. How about you? And the reality is there's all these things that people will do when you stand for the Lord. And David has made a stand for the Lord that has caused King Saul to look at him as the enemy. Because see, Saul wants to be the king, and there's a king of kings who he should be bowing to. Then it says in verse 30, Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war, and so it was whenever they went out that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so his name became highly esteemed. See, guys, if we want the kingdom of God to grow, we're going to be blessed when God uses other people as much or more as when he uses us. Can I get an amen to that? I'm as excited when someone gets saved at the church down the street as when they get saved here. We're not trying to build Calvary Chapel. We want to build the kingdom of God. But Saul's envious because Saul only wants the battle to be won if he can get the credit. Then we come to verse 1. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should what? Kill David. Now in the past, he was kind of veiling it a little bit. You know, he was not, you know, it was obvious he wanted him dead, but now he's just, he's gone beyond it and he's just saying it. I want David dead. Now what has David done so far? David slayed the giant that they could not slay. David brought victory over the Philistines. The same same army where Saul was hiding under a tree, holding onto one of the two swords, afraid to go out and fight. David went out and killed the, the, the champion and then caused the Philistines to flee. Then he won more victories for Israel. And oh, by the way, he came and faithfully served Saul. And he played you know, the harp or the lyre, some kind of stringed instrument. And every time he played it, the distressing spirit fled from Saul. So here he is being used mildly by the Lord. This is the guy we should want to hang out with, not kill. Can I get an amen to that? But Saul sees him as a threat because Saul wants to magnify himself while David only wants to magnify God. See, guys, if you want to magnify God, people who want to magnify themselves are going to look at you as the enemy. But guys, if we all want to magnify the Lord, we look at each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now watch this. Now, King Saul, by the way, is he a pretty level-headed guy? Is he pretty mild-mannered and calm? Is that the way we describe King Saul? King Saul, remember, he, he had made a rash oath that anybody that ate while they were getting ready to fight the film should be put to death. And his own son had eaten some honey while he was walking along the way. He wanted his son put to death. King Saul was the guy that saw anybody that was a threat and wanted him dead. So Jonathan now has heard that David has been given a death sentence. Now Jonathan, as we know from the previous chapters, he became very close with David. And it doesn't surprise me, because Jonathan went after the Philistines, just him and his armor bearer. So two against, you know, the Philistine army. And God gave him a great victory. He went out by himself with one of the two swords in his hands. So it's not surprising to me that, you know, the giant slayer used by the Lord and the guy who goes out and fights an army all by himself, that they're going to have a, a kindred spirit toward each other because they're both men who are being used mildly by the Lord, both men who are sold out 
for what God wants them to do, who are, uh, who are unafraid. And when you get around people who are on fire for God, if you're on fire for God, you become quick friends. Can I get an amen to that? So they're co- they've come together. And it says that Jonathan loved David more than his own soul. And he didn't see David as a, a rival for the throne. He saw David as the true king, and he was ready to submit to him. So Jonathan's going to respond to his dad, who's already been throwing spears at David. Saul, who already puts people to death at a blink. And Jonathan, look at the boldness he has here at the end of verse 1. Look what it says. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So his dad says, I want him dead. And Jonathan's going to go, hey, dad, he's actually a pretty good guy. And that takes some boldness. Can I get an amen to that? I don't know why I think of this. I think of like, you know, a godfather, his family dead, his pets dead, everybody dead, house burnt down, I want them all dead, kill them all. And then his son goes up, hey dad, I think he's a great guy actually. That's kind of what Jonathan's doing here. You know why? Because you can't threaten a believer with heaven. When you know the Lord and you have a relationship with the almighty God, there's no room for fear in your life. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind, Amen. And Jonathan's going to speak up for his brother. And I'll tell you what, that's a lesson we all should, we all should follow, amen? Because too often we can fall into the trap of gossiping about each other when we ought to be defending each other, amen? We've got to stand up for each other. We shouldn't, don't allow, by the way, gossip dies if you don't repeat it. Can I get an amen to that? So from this day forward, we're going to see he has a heavy eye on David that he wants him dead. And Saul, again, when we're on fire for the Lord, the world's going to be your enemy. And no longer does he seek to kill, you know, just to kill him and covet his ways. Instead, he's going to put an open hit out on David. He's going to let everybody know, I want this man dead. Now, we're going to see over the next several chapters, a period of years, more than 10 years, where David is going to be on the run from King Saul while he is the anointed king of Israel. Now, could he not have been complaining with God and arguing with God, like, what, did you not anoint me? What's up? You know, you anointed me as king, and this guy's still throwing spears at me. What's up? And David doesn't do that. David continues to leave Saul in God's hands. He continues to anoint him, to, you know, to uh, honor him as the king, because he recognizes that God raises people up, and God brings them down. It's not his job. He knows the calling God has on his life, and he was going to be patient and faithful until the time God put him in the place he wanted him to be. By the way, isn't that hard for us to do? Can I get an amen to that? We don't like to wait. But it's interesting, again, as we know, because Satan's resources are limited. You know, Satan is not omnipresent. Amen? He can't be everywhere at once. He's not the opposite of God. He doesn't even compare to God. He's maybe the opposite of like Michael the archangel. So yeah, he, you know, he's got some level of wisdom and yeah, he can do things that we can't do. But the reality is, he's a created being and he's not omnipresent. And he has a limited amount of followers. You know, a third of the angelicals went with him. They're now called demons. Now, I don't know how many that is. But I have an idea, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think Satan knows everybody. I don't think he knows the names of 7 billion people. I don't think so. I don't think he, you know, has, he doesn't. Now that being said, I think he knows Billy Graham's name. Can I get an amen to that? He knows the names of people being used by the Lord. And you've heard me say, I hope I'm living so out loud for Jesus that Satan knows my name. Amen? Some say, oh, Satan almost knew my name. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not so sure. But the reality is, that Satan is a defeated foe. But the target is on David because David is going to be used mildly by God. Let me tell you another reason why the target's on David. Because we know that the Bible tells us that the Messiah will be the son of David. Jesus is going to come through the line of David. Do you think Satan wants to destroy uh, David because he knows if I can destroy David, I can keep the Messiah from coming? That just proves how stupid he is because there's no way you can keep the Messiah from coming. Can I get an amen? So there's an enemy who wants to destroy us. And as David has this enemy, his own king, in his own kingdom, the kingdom he is going to reign in himself one day. And he has to run from him for the next 10 plus years. But he continues to keep his eyes on the Lord. I want to encourage all of us as we go through the trials of life. God knows you're in it. God knew it was coming. And God is still in control. Is God is still in control in David's life as he was when he anointed him king? 
God knows what he's doing. We need to learn to trust him. So point number one there in five ways. Uh, first of all, the, you're not alone in the midst of your trials. There's an enemy who wants to destroy you. Now here's five ways that God ministers to us in the midst of great difficulty like this. So the first one we're going to see here is you have a prince and a best friend who intercedes on your behalf. Says there, so Jonathan told David, saying, my father Saul seeks to kill you. Do you think Saul was pretty happy that his son went and told him? No. But notice where Jonathan's allegiance lies. It doesn't lie with his earthly father. It lies with his spiritual brother. Amen? Now, side note, there are people that will teach you honor your mother and father no matter what. And there was a teaching that went along in these big seminars. They say, whatever your parents tell you to do, you have to do it. Even if they're not saved and you're a Christian, and they tell you, if they're 70 and you're 50 and they tell you not to go to church, you shouldn't go to church because you've got to honor your mother and father. I think that's absolute nonsense. Because here's the reality. Children obey your parents in what? In what? In the Lord, for this is right. Amen? Now, we want to honor our parents, but if my, you know, thankfully I had godly parents, my dad was a pastor, but if my dad had called me and said, I, I demand you don't go to church, I'd say, Dad, I'm going, I'll be praying for you while I'm there. Can I get an amen to that? But here's the reality. Jonathan recognizes that even though his father has said, I want him dead, Jonathan's looking at things from a spiritual perspective, not a physical one. And he's not fearful of his dad, the king. He's fearful of Almighty God. And so he tells his brother, his spiritual brother, my dad is seeking to kill you. Saul as king had the authority to call for his death, and Jonathan and Saul's servants uh, were put into a tough spot. Should they obey, obey Saul, or should Jonathan obey not only the, uh, or the king and his father, or should he do what God is calling him to do? What should Jonathan do? What should we do? Guys, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? We obey God above everything else. While, the, while Satan and the world may hate you, Almighty God loves you. We ought to obey God rather than man, it says in Acts 5.29. Whose side is Jonathan going to be on? Again, these next verses continue to tell us. So he tells David, saying, My father seeks to kill you, therefore please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. Again, his father no doubt was furious. Jonathan, a faithful friend of David, was willing to lay down his life for him. The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. David very, Jonathan very clearly is willing to die for his brother David. And you know what? That ought to be the way that we see each other in the body of Christ. Can I get an amen to that? I love you guys. You guys are my family. I, I mean that. I say it, but this is a family reunion. That's why I hug everybody when you come in the door. Because you know what? At a family reunion, we'd hug each other. And see, that's the heart of, of David and Jonathan. They truly have a supernatural, Holy Spirit-driven love for each other. And that's how the body of Christ ought to be. So David, the rightful king, is going to be forced to flee from the palace. Now, just because he flees from the palace, it doesn't mean he's any less the rightful king. And just because God has a calling on your life and it hasn't happened yet, doesn't mean that calling's not real. Amen? Comes in God's perfect timing, according to God's perfect will. David had been called, he'd been anointed, but it wasn't time yet. And it's so hard for us to wait upon the Lord's perfect timing. Verse 3, And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you, then, I will, then what I observe, I will tell you. So Jonathan was not going to attack David, nor was he even going to be a neutral observer. He's fully on David's side. He's going to stand up for him with his father. He's going to warn him of potential harm, and even though it could result in the wrath of his father being poured out upon him, he still was going to make a stand for what was right. Do you ever wish someone would stand up for you? Have you ever been in a situation where you wish someone was on your side standing up for you? I want to encourage you tonight. If you know Jesus Christ, He is standing up for you. Amen? You are never alone. When you feel like you're alone, you're not. When you feel like no one's on your side, remember that you plus God is a majority. Again, if God is for me, who can be against me? Amen? Jonathan is standing up for David. And Jesus is standing up for you. Amen? What a faithful God we serve. Satan accuses us. Jesus defends us. And here's the good news. 
He doesn't defend us because we're good. He defends us because he's good. Amen? He doesn't defend us because we're defendable based on our behavior. He defends us because he's adopted us into his family. He's made us new creations in Christ. He's filled us with his Holy Spirit. He's redeemed us by, the shed, by his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. And he sees us as a pure white bride, even though we fall short. He defends us. He stands for us. Guys, the next time you're afraid to step out in faith, just remember you're not stepping out alone. Amen? Holy Spirit is in you. He goes with you. He goes before you. He's a great and awesome God. Now watch what happens. So now he's sidled up to his dad. And Jonathan's going to keep talking to his dad about David. Look what he says in verse 4 and 5. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. And again, he's got to be out of his comfort zone a little bit. And he knows the reality that his father could get mad and take out a sword and lop his head off. That wouldn't even be surprising. That's kind of right in Saul's character. But see, Jonathan is so focused on the spiritual that he's not worried about the physical. He's just not worried about it. I mean, I've told you guys this before, so it bears repeating. I remember going, I've been to India seven times, and we would go out into these villages out in the middle of nowhere. I would teach up to a thousand pastors all day, inductive Bible study, how to study and teach the Bible. And then at night, they would take me out to one of these village churches. And some of them were out in the middle of nowhere with no electricity. And you would think you'd gone back a hundred years in time. And one of them we went to, there were guys in loincloths holding spears. And the guy that took me out there, we brought a little generator, and we threw a, we threw a thing over the top with a light on it, and milled this village, and they all came out of their huts, and they're all standing there, and I'm sharing the Lord with my interpreter. And these guys have got spears and don't seem to be very happy. And the guy next to me, I'm looking at him like, bro, are we, we going to be all right over here? Or what we got going on? He goes, he goes, hey, bro, just keep preaching, man. You know, just don't worry about it. Heaven's better. I'm like, okay, you know what I mean? But the mentality is, that if we have an eternal perspective, we are indestructible until God's through with us. Amen? And Jonathan understood that. I'm going to be about God's business until God takes me out of this place. Because man can't do it unless God allows it. And he can't threaten me with heaven. Amen? And Jonathan comes alongside his dad, and he's interceding on behalf of his brother David, even though he knows it could cost him his life. And then what does he say about David to his father? Let not the king sin against his servant. He's calling his dad a sinner. Hey, dad, I don't think you should sin against David because he has not sinned against you and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistines. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all of Israel and you saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? Why, dad, why would you want to kill David? What has he done? He defeated, he's reminding him, he defeated the giants. He brought victory for us. He did great things that even brought honor to your name. Why would you want him dead? Now Jonathan is reasoning with him in a fair way. And we're going to see that for a moment, King Saul's going to listen to him. He's actually going to listen and say, well, you've made a good point. But guys, we know if people's faith is real by how long it lasts. Can I get an amen to that? We know they've really changed. If it, uh, if it lasts for 15 minutes, not so much. But we're going to see that for, at first, again, I love this picture. What's Jonathan doing? He's doing what Jesus does for us. Amen? He's standing with the king, right? And he's telling the king, hey, I know you don't like, but you know what? He's actually done good. And he's interceding on behalf of David with the king. And you know what? Jesus is interceding on our behalf with the Father. Amen? Because he sees us through shed blood, his own shed blood. So Jonathan, spirit-filled, fearless, had attacked the Philistines, is also willing to stand up even to his own father and to speak the truth with boldness. And again, he reminds him that all David had done. He, you know, he is the prince of, of, of Israel at that time, isn't he? Isn't his father the king, so he's the prince? Who's the prince of peace? Who's that? Jesus Christ. So look, he's a picture of Jesus right here because he's interceding with the king on behalf of David as Jesus intercedes on behalf of us, with the Father on behalf of us. He reminds him of all he has done, how he'd laid down his life. What a wonderful picture that is. And Jesus does the same. I paid the price for him, verse 6. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan and swore as the Lord lives... He shall not be killed. Boy, it'd be great if the chapter ended right there. 
But it doesn't. See, Saul's going to take a moment where he's going to say, you know what, everything you say makes sense. You're right, we should leave David alone. And he's listened to the wisdom of a godly man, but unfortunately, it's not going to last for long because he's going to get back in his flesh and become jealous once again and want to see David dead. As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. He basically swore in the name of the Lord. And we're going to find out that even though he made a pledge or a vow in the name of the Lord, he's not going to keep it for very long. Jonathan interceded, and Saul's heart was changed. Guys, we need to intercede on behalf of people that don't know the Lord that their hearts might be changed. Can I get an amen to that? I want to encourage you, the people that are most difficult in your life, start praying for them by name. Start praying, start praying for an opportunity to speak into their life. Start praying that their hearts would be changed, that God would do a work in them, verse 7. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. So the last time he was there, he got the spear thrown at him twice. Then he found out he wanted him dead, and now Saul has said, we're not going to kill him. So he brings David back, and David's back playing music again, and the distressing spirit is fleeing from Saul. Boy, this could be wonderful. The current king and the, the one who's about to be king, serving alongside each other. But sadly, one of them is a king of the flesh. Just as Jesus' intercession with the Father restores our fellowship with him, Jonathan's intercession restored David's fellowship with the king. The Bible rocks, amen? Amen. See, Jesus interceded so, so, so that man, sinful man, could be restored back to fellowship with the king of kings. And Jonathan interceded on behalf of David, so now fellowship has been restored with the earthly king. Now the difference is, our fellowship with the Lord will, will endure forever. Amen? Because of what Jesus did on our behalf. But that's not the same here with this earthly king. Again, you're not alone in your trials. You have an enemy who wants to destroy you. But you also have a great God who loves you, watches over you, and protects you. And you have a prince and a best friend who intercedes on your behalf. Jonathan interceded on behalf of David, a picture of what Jesus does for us as he's interceding on our behalf with our Heavenly Father. Point number two, the enemy's power is limited to what God will allow. As you're going through this trial and things don't seem fair, the, the job, you, the promotion you didn't get, a, a wayward rebellious child, uh, uh, a report from a doctor that seems unfair, what we need to know, we must always know that God is still in control no matter what. Amen? Well, we're surprised God never is. And, and Satan can't do anything unless God allows it. By the way, we are indestructible until God's through with us. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is thinking more time on the earth is better than heaven. Amen? I think when we truly have an eternal perspective, you can't threaten me with heaven. It brings a fearlessness for the things of God. Amen? Why, why are we so afraid to share with our neighbor because they might not like us? I mean, come on. Aren't you glad someone loved you enough to tell you the truth when it wasn't easy? Amen? Look at verse 8. Now, what does David keep doing? David, it says that there was a war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines. And struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. Man, you got to love this David, amen? Saul's supposed to be the king. Saul's supposed to be the mighty warrior. Saul, I don't think he's fighting at all. He might be back under that tree again. I don't know where he is. But David's out there fighting the battle again. Though David's life had been threatened, he remained faithful. And true calling remains faithful even in the midst of adversity. Guys, it's the people who I want to learn from are the people who face the greatest amount of adversity and don't waver. Can I get an amen to that? I've given A book I've given away more than any other book just about other than the Bible itself is a book called A Future and a Hope by John Corson. When someone's going through a trial, I'll, I'll order that and I'll just hand them that book. Why? He lost his wife in a car accident. He lost his daughter 15 years later on the same road. He recently, his son just went to heaven, and that brother hasn't... Now, he, he weeps, his heart is broken, but he remains faithful. Isn't that someone you want to have speak into your life? Can I get an amen to that? And the reality is that it's, 
when somebody has gone through difficulty, it gives them a greater opportunity to minister to somebody else, especially somebody who's going through the same thing they went through. Can I get an amen to that? Charmaine mentioned several people here who ministered to her, some who had already been down the road she was going down, and now she's going to have a chance, and Tim's going to have a chance to minister to other people that will go down that road in the future. Amen? Guys, no suffering is wasted. God knows what he's doing. He's a faithful God. And I love David's heart. Guys, we must never grow weary in well-doing. Amen? The enemy is a liar. And I just love how, by the way, did Goliath lie? Did the Philistines lie? What did they say? If you kill our champion, we'll surrender to you. They're still fighting the Philistines. So when, this, when Satan lies to you, don't be sh shocker. Yeah, amen? He lies. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. By the way, Jesus is the truth and Satan's the father of lies. So when you lie, you're being Satan-like. And when you tell the truth, you're being Christ-like. Remember that next time you want to exaggerate. Can I get an amen to that? And here's this example as he's out fighting the battle and being faithful, even in the midst of the faithless. Look at verse 9. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing music with his hand. The distressing spirit comes back on Saul. The man living outside of God's will is miserable. Saul has a spirit in his hand, and David's playing worship. It's a reflection of where their hearts are. See, Saul, Saul's faith is in his own strength, in his own ability, in, in, in his, the spear in his hand. And David's faith is in the Lord. David is filled with the Holy Spirit, and the sword he fought with, he fought with the sword, the word of God, and with an instrument of praise. That's a man that God can use. And sadly, amazingly, the faith of David is back in place where the spirits have been thrown at him twice. Twice they he tried to kill him. He told Jonathan, I want to kill him. He's back there again. He comes in to play music, to, to play worship for the distressing spirit to leave. And Saul's sitting over there holding the spear again. Here's a brother that's not afraid of heaven. Can I get an amen to that? David's like, well, God told me I'm going to be king. It hadn't happened yet, so I guess I'm indestructible. Same reason Goliath was nothing, because God's on our side. See, our God is greater than a boss with a spear in his hand. Get an amen to that. He's greater than any difficulty, any foe you may face. Guys, we're only overwhelmed. We only get anxious and fearful and worried because we're looking at things from the temporal perspective instead of from the eternal perspective. My homie created the universe. Amen? Homie got my back. Creator of the universe got my back. Amen? If God is for me, who can be against me? And David understood that. And that's why he lived such a radical life. Now watch what Saul does. You know, the enemy will use the same trick over and over. Can I get an amen to that? Especially if you fall for it. It'll, it'll just keep using it. Look what happens in verse 10. Look at this. So Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear. What happened to verse 7? With, no, we're not going to kill him now. Oh, you're right. You're right. We should, yeah, as the, to, in the, you know, before Almighty God, we shall not kill him. That vow lasted two and a half verses. Get to verse 10, and he tries to throw a spear at him. But he slipped away from Saul's presence, and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. Either Saul's got a lousy aim, or God is protecting David. And I think it's the second one. Can I get an amen to that? See, again, it doesn't matter how great the army is. It doesn't matter if it's 11 foot 750. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, Gideon's army of 300 against over 100,000. See, again, you plus God is a majority, and God is in control. Such a picture of the flesh and the spirit. Saul holding on to the spear and David holding on to the Lord. And again, David escaped. Again, God's not done with David. And you're not alone in the midst of your trial. So first two points there um, of five ways God ministers to us. You have a prince and a best friend. We have our Savior intercedes on our behalf. The enemy's power is limited to what God will allow. He, might, he wanted to kill David, but God wouldn't allow it. Number three, through his bride who ministers to you in the midst of, of her imperfection. So God, is, God uses, in this case, he's going to use David's bride to minister to him. And God uses, today for us, the bride of our Savior, which is the church, to minister to us. 
Amen? Let's take a look here, verses 11 through 17. Look at verse 11. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. He's not letting up. How many of you guys ever feel like Satan just isn't letting up against you? Or the enemy, the trials of life just keep coming. One comes and there's another one. Here comes another one. Man, it's overwhelming sometimes. Guys, God is still in control. His full-fledged call for assassination of David is back in full effect. What he had done but faithfully serve him. But when the enemy attacks you full force, it's usually when God has great things in store for you. We had a guy in our church in Santa Cruz. His name was Manny Barron. And Manny was one of these guys that I, every time you saw him, it was like, you know, he, he just had more joy than anybody you ever met. We, we, we made him a greeter because that's where that brother belonged. And he was just the happiest guy you ever saw all the time. And he was a rocket scientist. Those two things that typically go on, you know. So he was a rocket scientist and he was a super smart guy and he was just so happy all the time. And when you would tell him, hey man, I just lost my job. Hey, wow, you're going through a trial. You know what that means? God's going to do great stuff. You're blessed, brother. You're blessed. People didn't want to tell Manny bad stuff. Manny's just going to tell me how blessed I am. Oh, you got cancer? Praise the Lord. God's going to use it for his glory. You're blessed. You know, Satan's resource is limited. He's coming after you. It just means God's going to do great stuff. You're blessed. People say, it gets old. I loved it. I loved it. Hey, David, Saul wants to kill you. You know what that means? God's going to use you. Amen? His resources are limited. So it says there, he went there in the morning. He had an ambush in place to slay him. Now watch what happens. Jonathan already interceded on his behalf. Now here's his daughter, Michael who's David's wife. What is she going to do? It says there, Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. She warns David. Hey, David, my dad's coming to get you. You need to go or he's going to kill you. Verse 12. So Michael let David down through a window and he went and fled and escaped. Remember that Michael is Saul's daughter. So first... Jonathan warns David, now his daughter literally helps save his life. Again, Michael had left her father and was now cleaving to her husband. The Bible says a man shall leave her father and mother and be joined to his wife. See, so her relationship with her husband became more important than her relationship with her father because her husband was following God and her father wasn't. Amen? And I love this picture. She practices deception against her own father. It says there in verse 12 when it says he fled and escaped, I don't have time for it tonight. Read Psalm 59. Psalm 59 was written by David in the midst of this. And it tells us, he said, he says, he cries out, deliver me from my enemies, O God. Defend me. Rise up for those who rise, from those who rise up against me. Then he says, those who lie in wait, they're growling like a dog. They belch out of their mouth. Swords are in their hands. He says, not for my transgression nor my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves, though it's no fault of mine. You, O Lord, shall laugh at them. My merciful God shall come to meet me. And David ends with triumphal confidence in, the, in chapter 59 of Psalms. But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of trouble. To you, O my strength, I will sing praises. For, for God is my defense, my God of mercy. Don't you love this? He's in the midst of the greatest trial. People are trying to kill him, and he's singing praise songs. That's a great example for us. Can I get an amen to that? A lot of times when we're going through a trial, we didn't want to worship. We don't want to come to church. That's what we need to come the most. Can I get an amen to that? Now watch what Michael does. And Michael took an image and laid it in a bed and put a cover of goat's hair on its head and covered it with clothes. This might be the first time in history people pulled this trick. The teenagers skip out of the house and they, you know, they put pillows and you know, put something. So mom and dad look in, they think they're asleep. My, Michael might have started all of that, amen? It's interesting though that she had a family idol. So she had a shrine of some kind. And again, the, the word terror, it means to vanish as all idols do. And why, why did she have an idol? Because she's an imperfect bride. And why is it when we come to church sometimes, it isn't exactly what it could be or should be. It's because the bride isn't perfect because it's got people in them. Amen? Don't, don't walk away every time a church does something that isn't exactly what you want it to do. She set 
out to do whatever it would take to save her husband. Verse 14 and 15. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And Saul sent messengers back to see David saying, bring him to me in the bed that I may kill him. And when the messengers had come in, there was an image of the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. And then Saul said to Michael, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And Michael said, answered Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? Is any of that true? Did David threaten to kill his wife? She stands up for him, but then she also lies about him at the same time. Though she had started well in aiding David's escape, she caved in when she was confronted. And that's a lot of Christians sometimes. We'll make a stand for God when we're around a bunch of other believers, and we're really bold in our faith when we're at church. But then we get confronted out in the world, and all of a sudden we just fold up like a pup tent. Oh, it's easy to... You know, guys, we can praise Him in here pretty easily. Are we praising Him in the grocery store? Amen? Are we praising Him at work? Are we unashamed of Him in the same way that we're unashamed of Him here? Guys, we've got to take it with us out into our mission field. Michael was an imperfect bride. And again, the bride of Christ today is the church. And though he sees his bride as perfect and made holy by his blood, the church on earth is far from perfect. Again, because it's got people in it. Many walk away from the church because of its imperfections. I have people tell me, I don't want to go to church, there's too many hypocrites there. So then one more like you won't mess it up. Come on down. <laughs> Amen? How many of you have ever been a hypocrite before? You, come on, really? A hypocrite is a mask wearer, pretending to be something that you're not. Amen? We're all sinners saved by grace. I like those people that church. They do this different than I like, and they play music different than I like, and the pastor t- teaches forever. <laughs> but it's because of our imperfections that we desperately need the fellowship of other believers. Amen? Number four, the prophetic truth of God's word brings comfort, wisdom, and peace. Look what it says here in verse 18. So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him what Saul had done to him and he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. See, David fled and escaped, and where did he go? He went to the place where Samuel lived. When confronted with an intense trial, David makes his way to the prophet. See, David was in a, a heavy-duty trial. His, his father-in-law and the king is trying to kill him. He's been warned that his life is in danger by his brother-in-law, who's his best friend, and his wife. And so in the midst of that, where does he run? He runs to the prophet. Why? Because what does the prophet have? He has the word of God. Amen? And so when we're going through trials, we too should run to the word of God. Amen? See, this is where we go in the midst of difficulty is we, we spend time in the presence of the Lord and we open up his word and we have God minister to us. See, guys, the reason that we can stand up for the against the lies we got to know the truth amen when the enemy lies to you you got to know what the word of god says you can't stand with the word of god unless you spend time in the word of god amen too many christians have never read through the bible guys it's 66 books written by 40 authors on three continents and three languages over 1500 years of one central theme and no contradictions that's only possible because god wrote it and guys put down everything else turn off netflix for a while and read the word of god can i get an amen to that And you know what? When the trials come, you're going to have strength in the midst of it because you know what the Word of God says. The world lies. The Word of God is truth. He he was in the midst of a trial, so he ran to Samuel, the prophet who had the Word of God. And guys, we don't have prophets like that anymore. We have this. We have the completed Word of God now. And we can run to it. You and I in the midst of a trial should seek counsel and direction from the Lord. Unlike David, we hold the completed revelation in our hands. Come to the Lord in prayer. Seek direction from His Word. He and Samuel stayed in Naoth. It's located in Ramah. It seems Samuel established a school for the prophets there. In the midst of the trial, you know, it it talks about this. It's interesting. It said, you know, they stayed in Naoth and Ramah. And from other texts, it, it was a place where it was like Samuel was raising people up. So what did he do? He went to the place where people were studying the Word and spending time with the prophet. He went to be refreshed. And this is why we need to go and be refreshed in the Word of God. And we need to be refreshed by going to, you know, 
to the men's study and the women's study and going away to, to retreats. Guys, we need time when we set aside everything else from this world and we go hang out with the Lord. Amen? Undistracted. Turn everything else off. Spend time in His presence. I, th I think it's interesting. It says here uh, in verse 18, He told him what He had done and He went and stayed in now. What I love about this, it says in verse 19, that they... they Spent time together. He didn't just give him a word and send him away, but he invested in David. And God's called us not to make disciples, but, I mean, not to make converts, but disciples. Amen? It's not enough just to give somebody a word and walk away. Walk with them. If someone's going through a trial, put your arm around them. Be available. Walk with them. Invest in them. Pour your heart into them. And that's what Samuel's doing. He's got his arm around. Samuel anointed David. He knows he's the king. And David's walking with him and encouraging him and ministering to him. Boy, don't we all need friends like that? Can I get an amen to that? And we should be friends like that. Number five, the prophetic truth of God's word brings again that comfort and wisdom. Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful for that. Finally, the power of the Holy Spirit. Look what happens in verse 19 to the end of the chapter. Now it was told Saul, saying, take note, David is in Naoth and Ramah. Verse 20, then Saul sent messengers to take David, and when they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as a leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they prophesied. Man, I'm loving this. So they go to get David, and they're having a worship conference. All these, the prophets are gathered together, and they're all prophesying. I believe that there's different ways this word can be translated. I think it's worship. So all these people are worshiping the Lord, and they're crying out to God, and David's in the midst of them, and these people come to capture David, and when they come into the room, instead of capturing David, they drop their swords and start worshiping. What a great picture, amen? Guess what? It's about to get much more interesting than that. So they come, and when they come into the presence, they start to prophesy. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. He keeps sending people, and they're, you know, they're getting saved. They're getting the Holy Ghost, however you want to call it. Baptized the Holy Spirit. They walk in the room, and they're worshiping. There's, there's a praise fest going on. These guys walk in the room to do harm, and, the whole, and God's getting a hold of their hearts. Watch what even happens here. As we finish up. Then Saul sent messengers again a third time. They prophesied also. Then he also went to Ramah and came to, to, to the so great... He came to the great well that is in Seca, and so he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Indeed, they are at Naoth and Ramah. So he went to Naoth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. Guess who started singing praise songs? Saul! You know, God can bring anybody to a place of repentance. Can I get an amen to that? And here... Now, sadly, this is not going to continue. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon people for a time and then be removed. The difference is in the New Covenant, as New Creation, the Holy Spirit never leaves us. Amen? But in this case, Saul is brought to the end of himself again. He had done this before when he first was anointed king. But now he's, again, crying out to the Lord again. But sadly, it's not going to last. He's going to go from mocking to praising. It'll become a worship service. You know what? I love when people get saved, but I really love, I really love when I see someone who mocks God become someone who praises God. And there's several examples in my life. We had a guy, a guy in my office in, uh, Lank, down here in Woodland Hills back in the 80s and 90s. His name was John Keitlinger. And John was an older guy. He was an old crusty guy. Was, nah, 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 kind of those guys. You know what I'm talking about. And I was a young guy. And I had started a Bible study at work, and they started calling us a God squad and stuff. And he would come in, peek his head into the Bible study, and literally just cuss and mock God. We'd be in the lunchroom, and we would join hands to pray, me and some of the Christians in the office. And he would walk by, and I'd say something to the Easter Bunny for me while you're at it. And he just mocked God all the time. And I would talk to him about the Lord, and he would just mock God and mock God. He was a salty old guy. I'm like, no joy. Yeah, you're a lot of fun to be around, John. So one day, he came to me, and I don't remember what it was, but something where he literally asked me if I could pray for him. He had been mocking me probably five years. And he came by one day, you know, can you pray for me? I think it was about his daughter or something. I can't remember. And I prayed for him. 
Six weeks later, I baptized that brother in my, in my swimming pool. And then he started coming to the church where I was a youth pastor, and he was coming to our Tuesday night youth group with a bunch of teenagers. He was sitting in the front row taking notes. And then before you knew it, when we would go on outbooks, he was my roommate, and I discipled him, and he was 40, 30 years older than me. He's in heaven now. And you know what? He went from mocking God to coming to the Bible study. Guys, can our God do that? I've told you many times about Jehan Jehansu, my Muslim boss in San Jose. And she, dozen years, mocking my faith. And if you, some of you were here when we, she got baptized out here in Malibu. After she got saved, she didn't want anybody else to baptize her. And now she sends me texts and stuff. All she does, she's going to church, she's praising the Lord, she's plugged into a fellowship. Guys, it's so good to see someone mocking who starts worshiping. But the reality of it, it's not going to last just a few days going to last a lifetime. Amen? Saul's worshiping here. Sadly, I wish that was the last verse about Saul in the Bible, but it's not. And look what it says here. He also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? The word naked there doesn't mean completely out of clothes. He took off all his garments, all his kingly robes, he was probably down in his undergarments and he was laying flat on the ground worshiping the Lord. Man, God can do that, can't he? Now, he's not going to force himself on anybody and sadly, Saul is, is not going to remain there. Is Saul among the prophets. Saul was humbled in the presence of the Lord. He stripped off these robes he was so proud of. While Saul had an experience, the real fruit of the Spirit, it, real fruit is a Spirit-filled walk. The real fruit of that is a changed life. See, a lot of people will have a momentary experience but their life doesn't change. And the way that you know it's real is your life changes. Can I get an amen to that? The real fruit of the Holy Spirit is a transformed life. The real fruit of repentance is you become a... It doesn't mean you become perfect, because we're not going to be perfect until we get to heaven. Amen? But you're going to hate sin. You're going to see it from a different perspective. Your priorities are going to change. Your passions are going to change. And sadly for Saul, as we move through the next few chapters, he's going to go back to being that same old guy again. And guys, I pray for us that our walk with the Lord wouldn't be a momentary emotional moment, but it would be a life-changing event. Can I get an amen to that? As we become new creations in Christ. So, in closing, you're not alone in the midst of your trials. There is an enemy who wants to destroy you, but God is greater, amen? You have a prince and a best friend who intercedes on your behalf. His name's Jesus Christ. The enemy's power is limited to what God will allow. Satan can't do anything to you unless God allows it. Uh, through his bride, the church, he ministers to us in the midst of, even in the midst of an imperfect church, this is a place where we come and we get encouraged. This is a hospital, not a police station. The prophetic truth of God's word brings you comfort, wisdom, and peace. As David was in the midst of a trial, he ran to Samuel because he knew he had the word of eternal life. He could speak into his life. Guys, when we're going through a trial, don't run to the world for ungodly counsel. Run to the word of God for godly counsel. Amen? And then finally, where does it come? What does God give us in the midst of trials? He gives us the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to help us walk through the midst of the greatest trials. I want to tell you something. And, and I'm, you know, we, we all go through it. But I want to tell you that I think the, the greatest testimonies we have to a lost world most often are the people that have watched us and then they see us in the midst of a trial and they see that our faith remains. That speaks volumes to a lost and a dying world. Amen? JJ got saved. God used it to be the glory. But watching the, the health issues I had and when I almost died, and she finally said, you know what? If there is a God, it's, it's your God. I just don't know who he is yet. And my first Sunday back at church, she came to Calvary Santa Cruz, and then she started attending. And she didn't even get saved until after I moved here. She called me one day on the phone and said, you know what? I, I need to get saved. I'm like, pulled over on the side of the road and shared Jesus with her on the phone for an hour and prayed the sinner's prayer with her over the phone. And then she came down her six months later and got baptized. Guys, God, you know, we'll, we can share our faith a hundred times and sometimes the thing that God will use is the very thing that we think is unfair. Why did I have to go through this? So God will be glorified. Why did I have to go through this difficulty? So that God may use it to reach somebody else for the kingdom of God. See, you know what? Almost dying, being in a coma, being wiped out financially, it's worth it if one person gets saved. Can I get an amen to that? And guys, we need to recognize that no suffering is wasted and all that we go through, God will use for his glory if we will but let him. Amen? 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're a faithful God, you're in control. We thank you, Lord, that you're greater than a giant, you're greater than cancer, you're greater than financial difficulties, you're greater than a broken marriage, you're greater than, than prodigal sons and daughters, you're greater than a country that's turned its back on you, you're greater than all of it. And Lord, we're thankful that you're in control and you're a faithful God. And give us, Lord, a passion for you. Help us to stand for you when nobody else will. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit we, that we might be the men and women of God you've called us to be. Bring divine appointments, even tomorrow, even tonight. Bring divine appointments and opportunities for us to make a stand for you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, is he worthy to be worshipped? Let's worship.